thank you so much for coming through uh, for this workshop today. My name is Paul Kohlhaas. Um, I'm going to introduce these amazing gentlemen in a second. Um, so the topic for today's workshop is funding as a medium and a message, um, how we get capital, and the influence that it has on what we build. Um, the reason I chose this topic was because it came, became a very personal topic for me as well. Um, I saw a lot of kind of funding scenarios evolving in the Ethereum ecosystem over, um, over time, and I think it's a really important topic to actually address when we're opening. What are the different sources of capital? Where does capital come from? Um, what are the incentives that come with it? And how do we decide where to get it from if we need it? Um, cool, so just quickly, konnichiwa. <laughs> Um, our goals for today are really to foster, to foster an open conversation, um, to explore the role of funding and capital in Web3, um, specifically in funding Web3 infrastructure. Uh, we want to look at different sources of funding and incentive design. Um, we're going to go from centralized model to very decentralized models of funding. Um, and then what we really want to try and do is make this a very open platform um, for you guys to share your experiences, um, to discuss the problems that you've encountered, to ask questions. Um, yeah, so that's one of the core goals of the workshop. We really want to try and make this as interactive as we can. So please feel free to engage, ask questions, interrupt. Uh, it really shouldn't be like a very kind of front-facing um, workshop. Okay. Cool. Our workshop challenge for today are um, Andrew Keys from Dharma Capital. <laughs> Give a super quick intro. So, to uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I've been raising money. I feel like most of my adult career, uh, first at, at a tech startup, uh, within consensus, uh, I raised money for the launch of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. So, in, in kind of the open source standards world, and recently at Dharma Capital, where we uh, manage, I think, the largest actively managed Ethereum fund. Got 150 million dollars worth of ether in it, um, and I think I can speak to some of the issues with institutional allocators, open source grants, and uh, venture. Next up, we have uh, Amin Soleimani. Uh, hi, I'm Amin Soleimani. I'm the CEO of Snackchain. Uh, I have been the recipient of uh, grants before from PF to build payment channels and stuff. Uh, and also a summoner of the Moloch DAO, which helps fund open source infrastructure for Ethereum. And Jeff Emmett. Hey everybody, working on a project called the Common Stack, which is a collaboration between uh, Giveth and Block Science, and we're pushing forward uh, open source token engineering robust design in crypto economic systems. Um, and the first component we're building is an augmented body curve, which is a funding mechanism, a continuous funding mechanism for open source projects or for communities uh, around causes. Cool guys, thank you so much. Um, I want to give a brief intro to myself as well. Um, it's something that's really interesting. Often we, we're going to try and cover a host of topics in, in this workshop. Um, I always feel like to say, I like to say I'm not qualified to talk about any of these topics. But I've learned so much over the time, and what I'm really trying to do is really just share um, share my experiences. Um, give you a very brief background about myself. Um, I first got into Dogecoin in late 2013, got really interested in um, memetics and the first community economics that came with Dogecoin. I think no crypto presentation is ever complete without mentioning Dogecoin. Um, uh, I, I studied uh, economics in Switzerland, uh, in Cape Town, really fell down the Ethereum rabbit hole in late 2015. Uh, found a company called Little Maps, um, worked on an identity project with Uniset, uh, went to Defcon 2, uh, met a lot of people at Consensus, uh, joined Consensus for the first time, worked on Uport, then left Consensus and founded a company called Molecule. Um, where we're aiming to redesign the way that um, essentially decentralized drug development for biotech and pharma. Uh, we're launching our first app, and the fundraising topic for me again became very prominent. Um, this year we got into fundraising mode. Um, I had to kind of go through a lot of these the challenges that come with fundraising as well as the, the, the good sides. Um, so we really keep to, to share that all with you. Also previously received a grant from Maker. Um, been involved in a lot of fundraising initiatives with token sales. Um, yeah. Cool. So funding. Um, maybe quick question into the room. 
Uh, who has received funding before in any kind of form? Okay, it's a lot of people, um, which is great. So you can all kind of join in into the individual um, topics later on. Uh, maybe a hands up, who's received VC funding? Bastards. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we'll get into, so the structure of the workshop, well, I'll explain this again later, but we'll, we'll kind of go into each funding category. Uh, so the funding categories go from VC to DAOs to grants um, to token sales. Um, maybe hands up, who's, who's received funding by doing a token sale? Props. <laughs> <laughs> so that's interesting already, that's a lot less people than VC, which is, um, yeah, I, I think that's really interesting in this community. Who's received a grant before from any kind of grant issuing authority? Do-gooders. Wow, nice. Cool, that's more people than, um, than we had with, uh, with, uh, with token sales, less people than VC. Uh, Who has received um, funding from a DAO before? Nice, cool. Okay. Um, maybe a, a hands, like more of an open question to the room. Why do you guys feel that funding often feels like a kind of a taboo topic to to talk about in Bali? Like, do you guys feel like it is a taboo topic? No. no? Okay, so funding is very openly discussed in the Ethereum ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Would we all say yes to that? Or <laughs> you shake your head. I mean, which ecosystem here is which part of it? So our grant funding, I think, for example, is very transparent. It's very openly discussed. Probably things like VC funding, less so. It's kind of moving. It's almost moving in from the scale from nonprofit to for-profit, um, which also changes the scale in terms of transparency. Um, for example, for me, like as an early founder of Ethereum, because it was really hard to understand how any of these companies got VC funding. What was the business model? What was the incentive for the VC? How does the round structure work? Valuation, term sheet. Um, yeah, but maybe that's not a problem that's, that's unique um, to the Ethereum ecosystem. Cool. So why is funding a core tool uh, to build anything? Um, well, you've got to pay yourself. You want to grow your team and your product. Uh, legal expenses, um, community building, marketing, and awareness. Um, but what's really important to realize is that the source of funding fundamentally defines what you build, um, how you monetize it, and in what time frame you do that. Um, so getting a grant to fund your DAP has very different implications than getting a, trying to get to a VC to fund your DAO. And it's really important to understand what are the different incentives for those different um, uh, issuing authorities. Um, cool, so this is kind of the general framework that we're gonna follow going through each of these um, topics. Um, and as I said before, feel free to interrupt. Oh, guys, by the way, if you wanna come have a sit down, um, there's still spaces here in the front. I think he would add a ton about Oaki. Would you mind coming and sharing some beer with some of us, please? Yeah. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Sorry, we had to do that. <laughs> We, we, we literally, an hour before this, we said that we, we should have had you here. Okay, so here I am. Here you are. Cool. We are <laughs> Karen, thank you so much for joining us. Um, to also the other, um, we'll call them champions who have already introduced themselves. Do you want to give a quick intro? Or, uh, yeah, sure. So hi, I'm Kevin Iwaki. I'm one of the co-founders of Gitcoin. Our mission is to grow and sustain open source software, we have a software platform that connects funders to coders who want access to funding and vice versa. And I guess our most recent funding stuff we did in the ecosystem was Gitcoin Grants, which uh, just round three raised just under 300K for ETH 2.0 projects and projects in the ecosystem. And explain the matching. Yeah, because so, this is so rad. Yeah, so Glenn Weil and Vitalik published this post called Constraint Capital Liberal Radicalism, which is basically you have a pool of matching funds that will be distributed to projects that get crowdfund contributions, and instead of a one-to-one -one match, 
where if uh, Andrew gives $100 to Project A, it'll get matched by $100 from the matching fund that's distributed according to the breadth of contributions, not just the depth. So if Project A raises $100 from one donor, then it'll get matched less than Project B that got uh, $10 from 10 different donors. So both projects raised $100, but the second had much broader base of support. And so with quadratic matching, which is another word for constrained capital or liberal radicalism, it, you can have some of the projects on Gitcoin grants would, you with a $1 contribution would get $200 worth of matching just because they had such a broad base of support. So it's a, according to Glenn and Wild, a mathematically optimal way to fund public goods that the ecosystem cares about. And I think that's why Andrew invited me up here. <laughs> Okay, cool. So as we move through these different topics, uh, we'll look at what is being funded, what is being offered. Is this a for-profit model or a non-profit funding model? Um, governance, who makes the decision on what gets funded and what doesn't? Um, the incentives, who benefits from the funding? Uh, and then what are the key issues that, that can come um, with it? Um, we had this question already, who is the funding for? Um, I'm actually really glad that um, Kevin and you joined. So I think one of the core questions that we have in this ecosystem, uh, and that keeps coming up again, is like funding, how do we fund open source infrastructure? Um, and it's kind of the strategy of the commons problem. Um, yeah, like how do we fund open source infrastructure? There's a lot of expectation that funding goes into the base protocol layer once it's deployed. Um, but, we haven't really developed, I think, good models yet to, to scale that up. And I think that's why we're seeing so much investment and so much kind of scaling away from the core layer to monetize on other layers, like monetizing layer one and layer two, um, and so on. Um, and the core thing that I want to get into this is, um, well, kind of this is kind of what we're trying to do. Um, you guys can't see it, it's just public works. Um, and so in the, in the kind of in our current society, uh, we pay taxes in order to like pay for the roads to be done. Um, we kind of say we kind of pay taxes to use Ethereum to the miners, but that the miners don't kind of invest back into like continuous development of the roads and of the base layer. Um, so if we don't kind of find good ways to um, invest in public works or like we like we funnel capital into public works, then we end up with things like this, um, like shitty pothole roads. Um, and this is a really big problem, I think, not just a problem that we have in the, I think, in the current open, open blockchain space, but it's a problem in open source um, maintainment in general. Um, Kevin, maybe you have, or like any of you, um, I, I know it's really, really difficult to be maintained, to be paid as an open source maintainer for any kind of project. Um, uh, yes, I mean, I, I think that uh, our mission is to grow and sustain open source, but everyone up here has an interesting model that could be used to solve the coordination problem of funding our digital infrastructure. Uh, Commonsac and Mole of Dow uh, and Gitcoin Grants, I know, are all experimenting in the space, and so uh, I think a diversification of funding models it will make the ecosystem stronger, so I'd love to hear from the others on the panel, too. Cool. Um, we'll get into like each of the funding models this is, sure. and just like as a base opener. Okay, so we don't want this, um, so we need better funding models for the commons, um, which will be one big topic that we'll get to in the end. We also don't want this. Um, so this is a toll gate in China, um, and so like on the one side we have free roads, but if they're not maintained well, they're going to end up like this. Um, and on the other side, this kind of reminds me of some of the layer one solutions that are being built up. It's like if we start monetizing scalability too hard, then essentially it becomes like, like using Ethereum will be like passing from toll gate to toll gate. Um, that's also something that we want to avoid. Okay, so um, over the next kind of hour plus, uh, we're really going to kind of take a journey from uh, different for-profit models into non-profit models, uh, and then finally to the commons. Um, the first one that we're going to start with is venture capital, um, one of the oldest funding models um, in existence, um, I think compared to the other ones, not one of the oldest funding models in general. Um, cool. So let's talk about venture capital. Um, 
I think going back to earlier, I saw the most amount of hands up for people that had previously received VC. You guys mind raising your hand again? Okay. Does anyone want to speak about their experience, sharing experience they had with VC, um, maybe some of the issues they encountered? Yeah? The only language VCs understand is like FOMO, so yeah. you have seen a lot of line and then what's that? You speak the same language to VCs. Um, so the only way I got a VC to invest in my company was basically going in and said, Do I have full and in a week are you in? Um, they said yes, and that's money. Um, so that was my biggest thing is you have to show that there is, you know, a chance of missing out or you won't get funded. Um, you know, you know, your idea may be good, your model may be good. Um, that that doesn't really cut it sometimes. So, you have to feel the human nature. Thanks for that. Yeah. So um, one one other thing different is like the the environment was very different a couple years ago. We raised in 2017. These are like throwing us money. It's like so easy to raise in like mid 2017, like right when the crypto boom was starting. And then when we tried to raise like this year, it was like a completely different thing. VCs are like way more scared of the space. So I think a lot of it depends on the environment. Right? So, yeah. You see that from the round sizes as well. I mean, round sizes were like, and have now gone down to like very, um, very fair levels. I think that speaks to exactly what uh, the previous um, thing has said. It's like FOMO has decreased a lot in the space. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was going to say something similar, but it depends on the type of VC. Be an early stage or be an stage VC. Yeah. Um, and if it's a crowd deal, or just like a one off type thing. So, environment's important, but also the type of VC. Yeah. Are we? I'm coming from the VC side. I worked at a VC that invested in open source, which was really interesting. So, um, although I think that VCs do have FOMO, I think that also some VCs are really great in a lot of ways. But the issue is that crypto VC. VC in crypto is way different than VC in SaaS, right? Um, so venture capital works for a lot of models, but a lot of the businesses and the projects that we're building right now in crypto aren't served by the traditional venture capital return structures, investment process, um, and just in general, like, thesis. Um, and yeah. so we're seeing this disassociation with how venture capital can be applied to crypto projects. Um, and that's causing us to question, like, how private capital is being funneled to um, early tech innovation in the first place. Yeah. Really, really interesting comment. Um, I think something that will be very interesting to see play out is a lot. I think a lot of the, a lot of companies that are being funded at the moment fundamentally don't have a business model yet. It'll be very interesting to see at some point if if kind of like LP pressure starts rising on investments that were made that have large user bases that people are now using that have created this open infrastructure, but that now need to start monetizing that open infrastructure, which might kill those user bases. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. Really interesting to see how that evolves. Yeah. VCs pattern match. They look at what's been successful in the past, and then they look to apply that moving forward. And the patterns we're developing here don't map very well to the past. Yeah. Um, yeah. Generally speaking, some um, VCs on uh, with tech startups. Uh, I've just heard a lot of fail stories where there's been the odd rogue investor that had some power to do something wrong, and then they sort of um, yeah, basically try, try to maybe take the capital or, or do some dodgy move, but yeah. I've just heard time and time again the odd story of the one rogue investor that messes it for everyone, and then there's a lot of pain and torture in getting rid of that rogue investor, yeah. um, but that's in general, not what's specific here, so it's yeah. I think another generalization is uh, what we're seeing right now with, with uh, entities that try to become ubiquitous, like WeWork and Uber, that wanted to grow as quickly as possible uh, and, and didn't necessarily consider the balance sheets. And we're seeing that kind of unwind right now. And that was driven primarily by investor pressure okay. and, and uh, kind of balancing actually building a sustainable business with if I put a dollar in, how do I get $5 out? And, and, and recognizing that, that, that we actually do need balance sheets in the end. Okay. Um, for everyone who's kind of more new to the topic, I want to give a very quick overview. Um, so VC is generally a for-profit funding model. VCs invest to make money. Like, 
And, and that's a big confusion that sometimes people can have. If you're like building this cool open source project that's on the blockchain and decentralized, like, does it make money? No. Um, if it doesn't, then like, that's a hard pitch. Um, unless you can convince someone that you're going to grow to an enormous user base and somehow be able to monetize the user base. But, um, that was some uh, learning for me when you're coming out of the open source blockchain space. It's like people better make money, and if you don't make the money, they get angry. Um, uh, it's generally in exchange for company equity. We've seen a lot of SAF models evolve over time. There's also an increasing um, uh, there's an increasing trend back to equity, and then later maybe into SAF models again. Um, but yeah, that's generally um, generally how it works. If you don't have a company, if you're trying to raise VC and you don't have a company yet, um, and it's a decentralized team of go-getters and you're making it work, it's going to be hard to raise VC. And, and even before SAF, are we familiar with Y Combinator Safe? Standard agreement feature, okay. So, so yeah. like that's even more nuanced the, 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 the token part versus the actual equity that predated it. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a great comment. So just as a quick recap, company, a company normally has equi equity shares that can be issued. The easiest ways to raise early stage financing uh, are either through a safe, which is a simple agreement for future equity, or through something called a convertible note. A convertible note is a debt instrument that can be converted into equity at a later liquidation stage. So you could say, for example, um, you're now, you guys are just starting out, you have an early stage team, uh, you've created your company, and now, you sit, you're, for example, you're raising 200,000 in financing via a convertible note. So that's essentially a debt that comes onto your balance sheet, and that debt, you would then say to the VC, cool, and we're looking to raise a million in a year once we've hit those milestones, and once you raise that million, that uh, debt then converts into <coughs> equity. A little bit of background. Um, uh, generally, it's based on consecutive funding rounds, based on progress. Uh, and it's kind of like leveling up, which makes a lot of sense. Imagine it's a video game and you're moving from level to level. The bosses become harder, it becomes like more and more. Um, uh, and generally, you go from a friends and family round to a pre seed round to a seed round, and then series A, B, C, D. Uh, there's very few companies in the crypto space that have kind of made it into like this range. Like a Coinbase would be here. Um, <coughs> Most companies are kind of at most companies are at the pre-seed and seed stage. Uh, a lot of companies are at Series A. In, in Series A, you normally want serious kind of customer traction. Um, so, like your business model is starting to work, you're starting to generate first revenue. In general, it's only really exchanges, uh, in my opinion, that have made it into like it's like further further up the slide. Um, Andrew, I don't know if you have any. Yeah. Okay. Maybe to maybe to give you guys a range as well. So maybe friends and family rounds tend to be like you're really just raising early stage money to get going, maybe up to like fifty thousand or a hundred thousand. It really depends on you, obviously, on your um, on your friends and family. It's a horrible idea. <laughs> it's also it's, it's actually worst <laughs> way to do with your friends and your family. It's a hundred percent right. It's a great way to alienate your friends <laughs> and your family. I mean your family less if they believe in you and then I mean you screw up. Okay. Um, but but yeah, so I mean, but then your company failed and your family. Really, you really, <laughs> <laughs> really <laughs> it's, I mean, it's much better to raise from angels at the stage. Actually, sorry, I forgot to add angels here. Um, ideally, you'd raise from an angel who's not your friends or family, because <laughs> because Amin is right. If you fuck up your company, well, then your company is screwed and you lost your friends. <laughs> no, it's it's not that bad. Um, so a pretty seed. <laughs> A pre-seed is in general anything that you refer to um, the first kind of institutional money. Um, so this could be a very early stage fund and a couple of angels. It could also be a couple of angels. This, the range would be anywhere from like a hundred to up to uh, like up to a million. Uh, there's even like one and a half million dollar pre-seed rounds now. Uh, but this is, tends to be the range. Then seed now starts only starts upward of like 750 to a million. Uh, and then goes up to up to four. So there's seed rounds up to four to five million. Um, a lot of this is very flexible. Uh, the numbers over the past two to three years have just been going up, up, up. So companies raise more money at an earlier stage, uh, which is part of like I think we're seeing end to end this really big just excess in capital, um, which is also starting to flip now. As Andrew said earlier, with like IPOs kind of going bust. Um, the timeline. So really. You want to start making money within three to five years, minimum. Um, there's few businesses like that. I mean, there's 
very long-term big project companies, um, but that doesn't apply it to like to crypto in general. Um, uh, it, it's very centralized decision making. Um, so one thing that you have to remember is selling equity means you're selling a uh, stake in your company, which means now those people have a say over the governance and how you run your company. So there's many examples, um, kind of horror stories of like if a, if a VC doesn't like the way that you're leading your company or your team, um, they might just replace you in, a, in an upcoming funding round or the board will try to push you out. It doesn't happen. We haven't really seen that yet much in, in crypto, uh, but it is something to consider just from a governance perspective. Um, then VCs are really looking for 10x business models. So if you can't demonstrate how this is going to like 10x at, in terms of an investment, if they invest a million, they want to exit with 10 million, which means, for example, your business at that point needs to be, needs to really grow um, to match those numbers. Um, valuations and term sheets. Uh, so valuation is basically once you go to a VC. Uh, or even to an angel, once you sell equity, you're going to try and want to get to a valuation. Uh, which means you need to now put a price on your company, which now means you need to evaluate how much money could this company make at some point. Um, and then ideally you want to get to a term sheet. A term sheet is kind of the offer from the VC, how much they're willing to invest, um, and in what terms. Um, cool, and then there's uh, vesting. Um, which there's something that is often forgotten in crypto, we'll get to that a little bit later, but it's essentially how your own shares in the company um, or your employees' shares can invest over time. Cool, so this is really just to cover the basis. Um, I now really want to make this like an open kind of discussion round to discuss what is the role of VCs in funding decentralized open infrastructure, um, but also the role of VCs in like funding um, projects in the space in general. Um, Abby just had a great comment earlier that I think for a lot of open source business models, VC funding doesn't actually work well. Um, and yeah, maybe to kick it off, I want to hand it over to you guys in terms of experiences, in terms of... Well, that's, that's one thing we've come up uh, in the common stack, looking for funding to build the common stack. I'm looking at VCs, and the first question is often, what's your profit model? We're building open source components for communities to use, basically like a you know an SDK for for DAOs. We we don't have a profit model. We don't want a profit model, um, and that makes uh, the VC road a very difficult uh, road to walk for an open source project like the Common Stack. Some the projects that seem to have had some success raising from VCs uh, are projects that you know, they, they might have an open source infrastructure component, but they you know are going to then figure out how to add a business model on top of that. Uh, two come to mind that raised money uh, recently. One in, in both their Ethereum project, one is Uniswap, uh, and the other is InstaDAP. Uh, so Uniswap, uh, raise your hand if you know what Uniswap is. <laughs> Very cool, it's about half of you. It's like one of the coolest exchanges on Ethereum. Uh, it uses bonding curves, and, and it's an automated market maker. Those words mean nothing to you, it doesn't matter. It just means that you can always trade against it and it will always trade back with you. Uh, you can put money there. Um, it doesn't actually take any fees in its current implementation, but the team is building services around it and they're able to raise money uh, on the premise that those services would be valuable. Uh, Instadap, on the other hand, uh, it allows you to better manage your um, uh, CDPs. Uh, so who here knows what MakerDAO is and die? All right, cool, uh, almost all of you. So, uh, you can take a loan and you'll be paying some interest, but maybe there's a Compound, which is another platform where you can take a loan, and that gives you a better interest rate. And the, the process of moving your debt over from one of those platforms to the other is actually uh, quite annoying and like prone to error. And so they provide a valuable service and they take a fee for doing that, I think it's something like 0.5%, um, for being able to migrate uh, your, your loan over, and that's than an investable uh, business model, and they just close around. So. Nice. So to answer this question, I don't necessarily think there has been a role for VCs in funding decentralized open infrastructure. And I think that the notion of a decentralized open infrastructure being funded by a small gatekeeper really juxtaposes the notion of what we're trying to do uh, or what that infrastructure is trying to do. And I think that was kind of the aha moment with, I, I would say, the Ethereum token sale. It was that it wasn't 
a bunch of people on Sand Hill Road that were the gatekeepers to this. And I think that was kind of the aha moment of the token sale, although it got a little silly, uh, or, you know, token sales in general. Um, but, but I mean, this is, the future of finance is, is, is we're, we're witnessing it, where you, can, where you don't need the VCs. For everyone to come to the VC. Um, how do you guys feel though? So we've seen, we, I, I think we've largely we got to token sales just now as well. I think we've largely seen token sales disappear, um, and now there seems to be a big gap as well in terms of because now a lot of people are going back to the VCs. For example, projects like the Common Stack. I think you guys would totally go for the option of of like raising from everyone as a VC, but the market isn't there anymore, and the liquidity isn't there. I, I, I think. Um, yeah, but, uh, I forget who tweeted this just a couple weeks ago. They said the internet turned everyone into micro bloggers, and uh, the blockchain will turn everyone into micro investors. Um, and we see with the, at the Common Stack a future of kind of uh, community subscription models or uh, community investment models where you are paying a, a subscription fee and you receive you know, a token, an asset, which gives you governance in that community um, and also provides uh, capital to that community to continue doing good work. So kind of uh, merging these uh, for-profit and non-profit. Um, actually, going back to the, the point you made earlier about public works, um, the way we get things done as a human society is we, we pool our capital and then allocate it towards what's best. Now, we do that through taxes. That isn't necessarily efficient. We do that through the stock market. Uh, global capital pools to provide liquidity for uh, to do work and grow the value of what you gave them, um, but we don't have this for the nonprofit open source uh, infrastructure that doesn't have a revenue model. So I think that's we're really on the cusp of uh, figuring that out, um, and that's what we're really excited about at the Common Stack is basically creating that capital pool for a nonprofit open source infrastructure to uh, to survive and thrive. Um, cool. I would, yeah, I would hope you to. I have a question. So, yeah. even if you say that uh, that the internet, okay, blockchain has the potential of creating, making people micro investors, right? We most people are conditioned, okay, that if I'm going to invest my money, okay, I want this to make a return. So, they they are thinking like a VC. They are thinking, okay, that how can an open source uh, generate returns for me? So how how do you? Uh, I'm a novice, by the way, so I, I, I'd like to appreciate your views. Appreciate it. I have one thing on that. It's like VCs uh, often look for like you know, 10, 100,000 x returns, right? Yes. So like when they're doing what like Andrew was saying, they're like pushing you to go to the moon or explode fastly, get, you know, get their money out, stop wasting their time, and move on to the next project, right? But like if you're trying to build a community. Uh, you might not want to go that way, right? You might want to focus on like two x returns, uh, or like something you know something that might pay you back over a, a, maybe a longer timeline. Right. Uh, right. But it's also potentially less risky. Right. Right. And so there's different ways of thinking of like you know thinking like a VC is sort of a, a box where it's like you can think like a capitalist but not necessarily a VC. Okay. Thanks. Any other burning questions about VC funding? I would just say one yeah. thing about uh, corporate structures in this space. Um, I came from consensus, uh, and, and I think uh, with respect to kind of venture capital uh, consensus, uh, it's no surprise or secret that they uh, have tried or are trying to raise capital, and uh, when having these conversations, there were lots of businesses where the value essentially accrued to the protocol of Ethereum. Things like education, uh, things like the funding research. But that didn't fit into the box of if I put a dollar in, I get five dollars out. So so I think one, one other piece that I would say is that when we are talking venture capital, it, it, there is 
in many cases, kind of like product market fit modeling. If I put $1 in, how do I get this five, ten dollars $10 out? And uh, there is not too much in what I've experienced room for creativity. And, and I think that it, 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 one has to have you know, a serious conversation on if, if, if my business is going to accrue to a token or to the enterprise value of the company. Okay. Maybe a personal experience from my, from, uh, like from my side as well. I found, I found the experience of interacting with VCs, at least the ones that are more generalist, not like super deep crypto, small team, a very small fund. Uh, so the more general big VCs, I always found them a very disillusioning experience. Like VCs can be very smart, but they can also just be extremely like close-minded. Uh, and you come in there and you like you have this big vision and you're like, cool, this is what we're trying to do, this is all the cool things. And you get boiled down to like this very narrow set of questions, or like very kind of a very narrow view on the world that also doesn't fit, I think, with a lot of these new business models that we're kind of trying to build. VCs are also, like, the bulk of VCs are historically late to the party and, like, tend to be on the wrong side of the spectrum. There's really very few VCs that are actually outliers in their um, respective fields. But at the same time, being a VC, like, a partner, an analyst, I don't know why, but for some reason it's such a prestigious um, job title to have. Um, so there's also this very elitist feel mm -hmm. that comes with the culture of, like, being a VC, being funded by a VC, interacting with a VC. Um, that, yeah, I don't know, I found it a little bit always disillusioning to, to, be, to be interacting with. Um, I guess it's a really hard experience, like if you guys ever get to the point, and also a really hard experience to like pitch to someone, to like give them money, and kind of to go through those mm -hmm. continuous pitches, to refine your pitch. Um, yeah, it's actually really interesting to see if I compare like early slide decks that I made to like to like going through the experience and then like data state slide decks, you'll see how you keep boiling it down to like those core questions that, um, yeah. Cool, okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
So I don't think we defined, we, I don't think we even started talking about tokens, but but, but I, I think that right now, the capital markets don't necessarily have the appetite for them. We're seeing them as basically, in my opinion, glorified pink sheets where there's maybe five, $10 million raised. So what, what I, I do agree is the future of finance. I would just like to uh, see corporations or investors be able to hold them uh, easily on their balance sheets. And I think things like custody are hurdles to that right now. It also doesn't seem like they're doing it for equity, right? Like the securities that are getting tokenized are like, uh, you know, like some like real estate, or, yeah, some sort of real asset that's uh, generating revenue or something. So it's not quite like a VC would go and buy that. Right? They're looking for that moonshot. I think, no, yeah, to your point, I think it's important to differentiate. You can have tokens, and then you can have tokens representing equity, which then fits just as well into the venture capital kind of yeah. field. Yeah, I mean, those yeah. exist. There are, there are yeah. a lot of them. Yeah. 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 yeah, great comment. Um, one last thing. There's something yeah. called venture philanthropy, right? Venture philanthropy is basically um, like LGT, you know, kind of venture that that will have uh, people willing to put money behind something from a venture capital perspective. Maybe this capital recycling as opposed to getting something back. Um, and then, you know, you also have these um, donor advised funds, which are kind of like a DC approach where you get money directly from these guys, and all they want maybe is to recycle their capital. And that's a huge subset of the kind of uh, money that goes to these open source. Also, like UNICEF, they have a venture capital type fund, which is you know focused on out um, open source. And they're, the only problem with that they want to hold the, the IP, and then you have to struggle with that. So, um, but you know, there's that subset. A great, great finishing comment. Maybe I think to contextualize it, well, it's very easy to bash VC, <laughs> but um, I think VCs, a VC can add a ton of value to your startup. You just have to know that you kind of that you fit into like that box, so that you don't move too far out of the box. Uh, and then it's going to add a ton of value, like uh, in terms of like I've seen like very young, inexperienced teams get VC funding, and where the VC really tries to help you out, uh, do executive coaching, um, uh, make sure you guys stay on track, really revamp marketing, think about your go-to-market. Mm -hmm. um, so VCs also, I think, especially to the Ethereum space and to the startups that can come there, have added an enormous amount of professionalization mm -hmm. into the space. I think that's specifically prominent in DeFi. And we need that prof prof professionalization because we can't build everything open source and we're all like decentralized. If we want to service real customers, like real people, then we need professional products. And VCs do an enormous amount to like push us there as an ecosystem as well. Okay. Um, and then I think without VC funding, the Ethereum space in terms of growth would have struggled enormously over the past one and a half years, just as like any other form of financing essentially fell fell into, into the trough, into the winter that we're seeing. Cool, uh, next up, tokens. Um, who has, I saw less hands up than from EC. Who has received um, funding from a token launch again? <laughs> Do you guys want to, does anyone want to share an experience? What was it like going through that? Maybe at what point did you launch? What has it been like engaging with that community of investors? Is it public? Is it still private token? Is it public token? I would like to share a little bit. Yeah. Uh, we we read, we we go through the VC first, and then we uh, ran ICO, uh, which is a uh, it's a very mixed experience. Uh, it's a it's chaos all the time. Uh, it, it was in the, uh, February uh, 2018, which is a uh, very good timing. So um, uh, the token sale went pretty well, but there's tons of lot of scam, a lot of things going on. Um, yeah, so uh, for the other uh, uh, running a startup, build a, build a project, right? So um, uh, no matter if it's from the VC or from the ICO, uh, if you need the real money, it needs good money, right? So it's money for you to fund project going on. But as a startup, uh, dealing with ICO, uh, I would say definitely costs a lot of uh, a lot of energy to dealing with. So what can you do? Worry about if the SEC is going to after you. Mm -hmm. uh, worry about uh, what 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 those scammers going to hurt the reputation of the project. And uh, the, I think the even worst is later on you have the dealing with a lot of the token holders. Most of those token holders they are not necessarily uh, understand or have any visions uh, for your project. 
yeah. they, they just because of the time. People just want to make quick money. Yeah. Uh, but when the whole market is going down, yeah. we and me, myself, spend tons of, lot of time try to kind of comfort them and try to communicate with, with them. So this is, I have to say this is too much for a startup to try to do, do the real thing. Right. Some really, really good comments. Yeah. So any, anyone interested to discuss with me about this, so feel free to reach me. So luckily, I think we're doing good with that. So, so, so far, there's no problem <laughs> so far. I wonder if there's been like, um, almost like self-help group for like, post <laughs> <laughs> ICO. <laughs> um, no, I mean, on a serious note, I had a, uh, a friend who did, they did a token sale, and like he got like death threats, like from multiple different accounts. Um, and when the whole market is crashing and you're getting death threats from like your investors, uh, and, and that's an enormous amount of like, and then you don't even know if like the SEC is going to come after you, like you said. That's an enormous amount of psychological pressure, um, which I think is a lot at that um, at that stage. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I, I thought I will remain silent, but I decided to, I guess, for some insights. So, so um, I, I'm from Golden. So we, we did one of the early token sales back in 2016. And honestly, back then, I, I, I thought that this is a very natural path to finance that type of project. Exactly because there is like a, a very deep conflict between funding and infrastructure part, open source part of the stack, and venture funding. Like to, to me, it is obvious, and I, and I believe this is still like that. Of course, you can do a venture funding of the other things, like on the on the, on the higher level. Like I can perfectly imagine, like a cons co co consumer oriented um, project building on top of blockchains, an infrastructure project that has like a venture funding, but not for the lower level projects. But then, of course, like the the, the whole the idea of, of token sales of that type of, of, of Funding products got derailed in, in 2017 when we had like a, a, a dating app uh, uh, tokenized projects during ICOs and, and other things like that. Which, like to me, it was especially like painful to look at that because I, I felt like oh Jesus, and now I'm part of that. Yeah. Uh, while really, you know, in, in, in we we did the sale in, in November. 2016, that, that that looked like like really the way of, of collecting like a very very, very special uh, type of, of, of funding for very special type of projects like not like um, an, an easy tool for everyone to get money for whatever um, and and the same time I, I believe that that's really pity that what happened in 2017 like discredited the, the whole idea because. Exactly because of that, we have a problem you mentioned of the funding for Ethereum ecosystem and other other parts of the centralized ecosystem. Uh, that that and then that VC funding cannot solve. I, I believe that e even today we can see maybe not exactly in, in the core Ethereum community, but in a in a in a, in a broader blockchain space. That that I, I have a feeling I I don't have like a her data on that maybe someone from analysts could comment on, on that statement. But, but I think like we, we, we started now the, the race like for the for the, 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 the kind of like a blockchain maximalism but, but driven by the by the visit funding that that, that that now the approach is that, that you know the the real jackpot will be for for a VC funded project that will build a, like a closed solution that everyone will use. Using the, 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 the kind of technologies that, that we are developing here. So yeah, to, to, to summarize, I, I, I believe that you know token is, 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 is a great way to, to finance like a very special type of project. Also, I don't think this is like really in the scope of, of, of the meeting today, but I think that we have like a problem with the with the, with the, with the token economics in, in, in general. So we need the, like a much more exciting ways tokens can be used. I, I, I think that that like the, the, the whole idea of fat protocols is, is not really working. Maybe apart from like a very special 
low-level cases like Ethereum, for example, but not for the for the many projects higher in the stack. So, so, and and I think like that that really like things like like um, um, like for example like discussing radical markets. Oh, there are a lot of ideas that uh, in funding, in reputation, in governance that can be used built around tokens. And I think we are only at the start of that way. So, so, so that for sure needs to be taken care of to to move move on with, with, with tokens. And of course, like cool ideas like comparing comparing. Uh, DAO approach with the with the ICO approach that you have some control over the how the money is spent. You can terminate the funding if the teams like cease to do anything and so on. That that that's also important. Um, I I don't really know about VC how how that can be repaired and and move in. So yeah, I I I, I think you. I'm, I'm talking too long, so I will stop here. No, I, I just wanted to thank you so much. I think that, that was a really great comment. Um, same with the previous um, uh, speaker. Um, I, I want to add to that. So specifically, those early token sales, I think, fully followed the ethos of what we were trying to do. And then later on, we got dating apps and all kinds of stuff. I still think if the, if we would have if the DAO, the original of the DAO, would have survived, I think it would have put a stop to a lot of the madness that was going on because the DAO would have been this could have been this collective uh, efficient capital allocation mechanism into good projects, forcing them to actually do due diligence, how they spend their funds, all of that, um, rather than everyone just slapping up, like a smart contract onto mainnet and being yeah, like, well, sent, sent funds to this address. We, uh, we decided I, to do the token sale after uh, the DAO collapsed. Like, before yeah, that, we, we, yeah. we were preparing a like, proposal yeah. for the DAO. I, think, I, I, I just think in terms of the madness that we saw, I think if the DAO hadn't, I mean, the DAO itself was complete madness, like, who gave you wrong there? But, like, if it had worked, then I think it would have been a great filter. Um, Griff, I saw you nodding your head a lot. Do you want to add anything? <laughs> so, Griff is actually one of the original, um, let's say, collaborators, or like, on? Yeah, I was one of the, uh, one of the five employees of Slotbit. Uh, so, you know, yeah, I was there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and it definitely changed it. Everyone kind of had an excuse to not put. Uh, you know, some kind of accountability on chain. It's like, well, the DAO was hacked, so put the money in my multi save okay, it's safe. And yeah, that became an excuse kind of to just mm -hmm. do what was in your best interest yeah. as a team. So, uh, so, so there, there, there is an interesting evolution that I think is happening with the organization. Uh, there's a group out of consensus called Coven. Which, which takes the concept of a two and 20 carry, or you know, let, let's just say the fees that would accrue to a venture fund, and, and basically parses it by uh, the, the person who sources the deal uh, could receive 10% of the two and 20. The people that do the technical due diligence, the business due diligence, the legal due diligence could receive a part of that two and 20. And if you source the deal and no one wants to fund it, you could actually lose your stake. So there are these kind of next generation game theoretical models that are kind of creating a hybrid uh, with venture and tokenization, which I think are, are kind of the evolution of what could happen. And with that, you have kind of this broader sense of due diligence where you, you could see in a future state, anybody could do that technical due diligence. And, and you can have reputation, and, and if, if you're great at this, you, you get a score, and, and then become someone that's sought after to do technical due diligence. So you can really kind of decentralize the concept of venture funding. Can I, can I try to get a sense of the room? <coughs> who bought tokens? Um, who bought tokens uh, in 2017? Right. Uh, who? Who in 2017 or 18 thought that like tokenization was the future, uh, and that we were like totally owning the VCs, <laughs> right? Uh, who still thinks that? I think tokenization. <laughs> right. So um, it, it it was also pretty case specific, right? Uh, people launched a lot of different kinds of tokens. Um, Many of the tokens made absolutely no sense from an economic standpoint. You, you said you're a golem, right? Yeah. Uh, so your token was a two-sided marketplace that was used to transact. It makes no sense. Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and some people launched token sales that were like super exploitative and tried to get as much money as possible. Uh, maybe this guy who's uh, trying to comfort uh, his, his, you know, uh, ICO buyers. Um, I launched worse than a dating token. I, I run a porn company. It's called Spanking, right? Uh, so I launched ICO and I raised six and a half million dollars in a global public auction for Spank tokens. Uh, and the premise behind Spank tokens is that you can stake them in the Spank Bank which is our algorithmic central bank that mints booty tokens based on our fees. Uh, and so it actually powers a circular economy that makes sense, right? Now, the execution, you know, falling market, whatever, like, it's been hard for us to get traction, and, but like, as, you know, as we continue to grow as a company, uh, the, the token holders, like, will benefit from the growth of our economy, right? Like, that there is value capture present in the protocol. Right. And, and further, the, the way that we launched, the, the sold the token specifically, was, was not intending to capture as much of the possible value on the table. Uh, I actually launched the most fair ICO ever. Uh, <coughs> I can say that because it's, it's true. If you look it up. Uh, <laughs> so the, the way we designed it was it, it was a, a single round blind uh, auction. And so you would submit the, the, uh, a series of bids. So we actually sort of use state channels for this as a state channel guide consensus. Um, so you, you would deposit a bunch of your ether onto the contract. And afterwards you would place bids which would have the price and the quantity. Uh, and so it would be the amount of spank that you wanted and the, and the price you'd really pay for it. And so you could submit any of those up to the total deposit that you placed. And that approximated your demand curve, right? And so then what we did is we, we got all of those bids together and we, uh, we had our own supply curve, which was the amount of tokens that we were willing to sell at each price. We figured out where those matched, we picked a, a strike price, and then we gave everybody the same price. And so we, we sold 30% of the tokens uh, and, and raised six and a half million dollars. And the, the benefit of doing it that way is that, you know, even at, like in the best case, the token was up 30x from the sale. Uh, and in the worst case, it's down about 4x, right? And so it's like, you know, you have, you have some token sales that were so exploitative that they're down 99% from the point of the sale, right? And so, you, you know, uh, when you're talking about these, don't try to lump everything into a category, even if it is uh, a dating app or a porn porn. Just to, just to add on that, um, I was in a debate on Twitter about two months ago about how uh, all tokens are not equal, and we really need a decentralized rating agency to rate the AAA shitcoins from the, um, the worst shitcoins. Uh, and, and so the problem with that is when you create a ratings agency, well, how do you prevent capture of that ratings agency to, you know, you, you, you give them a bribe and they rate your, your shitcoin uh, higher. And so, so I, th I think it would be interesting to see a trusted community source that, that can separate the, uh, the worst shitcoins from the best ones. And, and you know, I think it means the way Mean framed it as being down 4x is way different than being down 99%, and I agree with that. The, um, someone, I was talking to someone at Eve Berlin who was saying, oh, multi-collateral die with Maker is going to be that. So basically, right now the collateral in Maker that, that makes die into a stablecoin is ETH and that single collateral die. And in the future, we're going to have Augur or um, I forget what, what tokens are going to be launched in multi-collateral die. But you can basically look uh, as, as more tokens are staked to create die in, 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 in Maker's economics at, at the different attributes of, of, of those markets. And then you can use that to approximate a rating for each of those tokens based off volume and, and, and the flow of the tokens in multi collateral die. So uh, I guess the, the, to sum up my point, two points. A decentralized rating agency will be important. It will, and making sure that it's not capturable will be important, and maybe multi collateral die could do that. We're already starting, it's not necessarily decentralized, but the, I think it was two weeks ago, Coinbase et al. is creating a rating to define if something's a utility or a security, mm -hmm. and I think that's a step in the right direction. Yep. 
Last comment? That, I mean, that was ridiculous. Now that he's not in the room, I feel like I can say that. Thank God. Um, <laughs> but, kind of from a high level, and I think it's interesting, um, you know, juxtaposing against our previous discussion of VCs and how can they fund a model that is open source and not necessarily have a profit model driven. Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting to, you know, talk about like token prices, like, you know, we heard like value capture in the token model. I think that it really goes against what we're saying where the token or like some sort of like crowdfunding is good for you know funding open source projects when really in fact people who are funding that are really just looking for a return, yeah. which brings us back to the VC model where there's smaller VCs for less money. Um, and so I think it's very important to think about why you're raising money. And if you're raising money for the people looking to invest expecting a large return. If you are and you can't sell VCs, then you're just pretty much placing people with less due diligence than VCs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think from that model, it's important to note um, that just uh, you know, token price increasing is not a good problem. Mm -hmm. I think a great comment as well. Um, how, do, in just maybe to ask a kind of question, how does Ethereum for you fit into that model? Like the um, Ethereum crowd sell? Want my answer? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I don't, personally, I don't think layer one should have their own token that is fluctuating, I think it's all disabled. I think instead of gas fees, that um, all layer one should adapt, adopt a SaaS model. Um, you know, you don't pay for maybe like a drop off stores and say you pay a thousand dollars a month on one of those transactions. Yeah. Um, and I think in that sense, I think, you know, owners of notes should be um, paid an actual percentage of time. Um, on what they're doing down the network. So that means not volatility. The problem with that is that then you're always like the dollar's pitch. You know, like if, you're, if your protocol depends on the stable value of the dollar, then yeah. you can never operate independently of it. I'm not saying it's all. I'm just saying any sort of stable. There's no need for stuff to fluctuate. Uh, that's that's impossible. <laughs> okay. Like, not even worth saying. <laughs> okay, for the sake of time. Um, we going to move on. Uh, we kind of went through a lot of this, but yeah, okay. So this is what we saw a lot in 2018. I really just love this meeting. Um, the one that, uh, the, the white paper, like what, what was promised in the white paper? What was um, the production and then actual product release? I think we saw a ton of this, which also discredited the whole blockchain space. Uh, un unfortunately, but I think a lot of enterprises have kind of made the 360 circle come come to realize, like explore the space, be very disillusioned, but then come to realize, okay, there is actual value um, to be <laughs> to be delivered. Cool. Just wanted to show you. And yeah, and the hype cycle. Um, and we saw a lot of this as well. What is your business plan? Like, what is the value capture for the token? I think 95% of tokens um, that are on coin market cap, like fundamentally, don't have like there's no working model that is beyond like there's a limited supply and it's listed somewhere. Um, okay, we went through a lot of this, so I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna go into depth again. And maybe some of the important things to differentiate with token models. Um, I think there's both for-profit and non-profit incentive models. Um, uh, something that Andrew mentioned earlier, I think we really need to strongly differentiate in token models or in token sales or tokenized business models between an application layer token and a protocol layer token. Um, I, I think that's fair. Uh, one thing to, to go back to the Ethereum crowd sale that I think uh, triggered me was that there was no vesting. Uh, it, it, uh, Vitalik is still grunting away and nine-tenths of the other people that got, what, 15 million Ether are, are off to raise another token or run a competing protocol, etc. So, <coughs> Uh, you know, making that type of behavioral economic incentive makes a lot of sense. I think Blockstream is an example within Bitcoin where they 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 vest uh, time released Bitcoins, um, and obviously that's a little bit of a different uh, because it's a for profit entity. But um, kind of baking in typical concepts like vesting in a corporation. Uh, I think, and I think that there is a huge tragedy of the commons yeah. uh, issue. You know, think about all the people that are working on E2.0 uh, versus Gav uh, or, or or Jeff Wilkie, who I think added value to you know E1.0. Um, 
but got 300,000 ether at a penny. Uh, so I think thinking about those types of tragedy of the commons issues is very important. And I think there, I think there was a lot of like misraised funds via token sales at the application layer, which fundamentally these should have been, uh, maybe like ideally like maybe even cash flow positive businesses bootstrapped or VC funded. If they had been, if they had tried to get VC funding, probably a lot of that space, a lot of the coins that we see listed wouldn't exist today. Um, protocol A, I think, is a very different thing. Just some generalizing things. And in general, we do a token sale to exchange for a network stake or an asset. So that goes into was raised um, with the security earlier. Uh, it's often in a past been a lump sum financing. It also comes with a lot of issues. So boom, here's uh, twenty million dollars. Um, how are you gonna like? How do you disperse that over time? And like with that, there hasn't been like um, the same experience as you have with VC, which is the kind of leveling up aspect. Um, um, kind of a more decentralized decision making by funders. So like, uh, Orwoki said, like everyone's a VC. Um, there's various business and operating models we've gone through that. I think the key problems that a lot of companies have faced is like the legal the incentives uh, of the funders and then the, the token models. Um, cool. Um, maybe as a last question, um, before we close the token topic, um, to come back again, what do, what do you guys feel is the role of tokens in funding decentralized open infrastructure? Projects are building. Yeah, so I got it. Uh, this is a topic. It's of utility. I was talking that you like uh, get money to build utility. And then after one year, two years, six months, three months, you have return. Uh, instead of building the utility first, then raising a token for that. Yeah. Resting. And I mean, if you if you can build the utility without raising a token, then you probably shouldn't integrate a token into the model later on, unless it solves like a fundamental, yeah, unless it solves a fundamental problem. So I mean. I guess I'll chime in and say that uh, several months ago, uh, I authored an EIP that talks yes. about using inflation funding uh, on the Ethereum mainnet. And um, boy, the current controversy is ProgPal. I guess five months ago, the controversy was block rewards funding. And uh, you know, the whole problem is is basically with if you create inflation funding at, at layer one of a protocol, then then how do you prevent capture of that inflation funding by 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 people who just want to be the oligarchs of the network? And uh, basically, with proof of work, you can prove that miners are adding value to the network because there's a consensus algorithm that says that miners are adding value to the network. But with software development the value proposition is inherently abstract and um, you know the software developers are sometimes not great communicators and I don't even know if the project that I worked on for the last month that I'm going to launch at DEFCON is going to have any value to the community because uh, value propositions are, are subjective and so there's the room for capture of funding of, of open source infrastructure via inflation funding. Vitalik sums it, sums it up really nicely in his blog post on collusion, which is on his website. There is a inescapable trade-off between failure to fund legitimate public goods and enabling a plutocracy. Uh, and I think that that's why the block reward funding on the Ethereum project mainnet that that EIP is dead. And and um, maybe we'll see it on a on a side network or maybe an incent a uh, testnet that has value or some other platform, but we're not going to see it on Ethereum anytime soon, I don't think. Maybe a show of hands, who's for inflation funding? But in what context? Yeah. Yeah. In, in the context that you just described, in the context of well, the So I mean, like, the picture of the horse that you had of, like, being drawn <laughs> out progressively is sort of relevant here. I mean, my EIP was broken up into three sections. The first is that software development is is valuable. The second was that current methods of funding open source infrastructure are not working. And the third is we should explore block reward funding. It was designed to be a gradient of of, of fully bakedness and controversy where I don't think, I think in this room people would, uh, how many people agree that software development is valuable to Ethereum? 
<laughs> All right, how many people think that current mechanisms are not working? How many people think that we should use inflation funding uh, to deploy capital to ETH 2.0 clients? High inflation. There you go. So that's the gradient right there. Well, the thing I, I think for me is that it's not in relation like the problem, but the game theory behind it. Yeah, yeah it's a sure. That's the kind of work. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The game theory is just like a, another thing, another economic thing that you might put in a protocol. So this is like a really fun conversation to have in the abstract, and Kevin props to just like bulldozing ahead and putting it into practice. Uh, and so people are like, it's a can of worms, don't open it. We're like, let's just take a look. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, what? And so like, we looked, uh, and we found the worms, right? Yeah. Um, we made a telegram group, there's like a couple hundred people in it, and like, a bunch of people came in and like, started being, well, I think the core devs should be responsible for distributing funding, uh, because we know best. Right? And then like Aragon comes in and is like, well, we should put the money in an Aragon DAO because, and, you know, and then I'm like, well, I should clearly be in charge. Uh, and, you know, I'm right. But uh, that, that's irrelevant. The, the, the point is, is like, by, by the virtue that nobody else wants to, you know, give, give me the legitimacy to spend the money, even if I think I'm right. Like, it's the same exact way I'm thinking about other people trying to spend the money. And so it's a deadlock, right? And, it, and it's, it, it devolved into this sort of like political, power struggle, uh, and then that's when I rage quit that whole thing. Uh, and I was like, I'm out of here, uh, I see the worms. <laughs> like, uh, this, is, this is what people warn you about, right? It's, it's that the whole thing could lose legitimacy because people could believe that it has been captured by some special interest, and that potentially is more damaging to the project than the, the value that the funding would, would provide. I will say that the architecture of Mullifdal is quite elegant where the amount of influence that you have is only relative to the amount of tokens that you've, was it like staked or I guess you're called the tribute in, in Mullifdal. And so basically uh, no one will ever have more influence than the value they brought to the table in the first place. Whereas with block rewards funding, it the, the funding is being created out of thin air by inflation and therefore you don't have that sort of Mechanism. Yeah, I want to caveat this too with, uh, we started the inflation conversation with the goal of like, you know, a noble, noble goal of it's like long term, how are we going to sustain this forever, right? Like in five years, how are we going to fund devs? Like EF is, you know, runs out of money, whatever, like we still want to keep doing this, right? So th that part, I'm still in favor of, like I, I believe that we should, I'm optimistic that we'll, you know, come up with something and maybe be able to do it. But I think that the bar is really high to earn legitimacy to be able to, to drive that conversation, right? And, and we're like, the proposals are like, let's just put it in a DAO. We're like, you guys remember what happened last time? Like, uh, and, and like, we as a community haven't even participated in DAOs. We have, we're not used to this. Like, we haven't learned from, through experience of managing funds this way. We haven't made mistakes, right? So my take on this was like, let's run a bunch of controlled experiments. Uh, and, and so I uh, summoned Malik Dao, and we can talk more about that later. Um, but like, it's it's still possible for this to evolve in a direction where some DAO-like structure uh, does inflation now. Uh, other people wanted to like use the money to pay for core devs immediately, um, and, and and the situation there was like ETH was like a hundred dollars. Uh, yeah, Frontway was like you know shaky, and and people were rightfully concerned. But then like as ETH rose up. Immediacy of, of the, the need was sort of faded away, right? And it, and it means that like we shouldn't take an insane risk. We should we should try to uh, work up to it, right? And that's that's what I thought. So um, uh, I, I think that, you know it's still an important thing to continue. It's like very slowly, maybe if we open the can, right? <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah. I think speaking of experiments. Here we are experimenting with different funding models. And so right. Maybe we'll work our way like up. The Gitcoin exactly. matching is uh, I love really it. cool. Yeah. Like, it's the best. I think this is the perfect segue into our next topic. We talked, just quickly, we talked about vesting. Maybe one last thing um, that we haven't talked about, uh, like, and but Andrew actually briefly mentioned it, uh, like VC token launches. Um, and just something like to quickly mention here, it's a very common problem of like private capital versus public capital valuations. Uh, and we now see this with companies like Google, WeWork, um, as Andrew mentioned, going public. 
Um, I think with, there's many recent examples in crypto where a VC fund, extremely VC funded coin tries to go, go public and then loses the majority of its valuation due to public market. So um, maybe as a last, last caveat here. Um, <coughs> but there's two, there's two maybe things to, to bring up. Just uh, one is uh, Zcash and the other is Green. Yeah. Uh, Zcash, who, who here knows what Zcash is? <coughs> Uh, who here knows that Zcash has 20% inflation funding? All right, cool. So they put that in at the beginning. Uh, they said, we're, for three years, we're going to give the uh, developer fund 20% uh, of the uh, protocol rewards uh, to pay for, for development, right? That works when you do it at the beginning. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't quite work when you try to add it later. Um, as we're seeing. I mean, so, it's kind of like a social contract, like in the beginning, yeah. if you, it's, you opt into the in, in the beginning and then you believe in it, but once later, if you try to change the contract later on, then you get forced. Right. Uh, and the other thing is, is Grin, and Grin raised a bunch of money and it was like touted by all the VCs as like fair money. Who here knows what Grin is? They're like happy. Um, and they had no inflation funding for devs, they had no dev pool, they are like, everybody who makes money off this has to mine. Uh, and what happened was like the most predictable tragedy of the commons ever, which is like, one, all the people who are operating your protocol are VCs who are greedy, uh, and, and, and two, you have no money set for devs. So the devs were like broke and trying to like, you know, plead with the VCs to pay them to continue doing work, and, and barely any of the VCs wanted to do it. Uh, and yeah, I don't, I don't really know how that went. I stopped following it. I don't think they're going to Which fundamentally doesn't make sense, but that's the classic tragedy of the commons problem. You had a bunch of VCs that invested into the miners, but no one's willing to continue funding the actual protocol development. Right. It doesn't make any cognitive sense, but like it's this, um, yeah, it's like from a single act, from a single actor's perspective, you're like, well, let somebody else fund it. Why should we fund it? I think that's one of the reasons why I think in the blockchain space you saw the creation of, of these community funds. But like a lot of big of the of the bigger projects simultaneously also raised their own VC fund to support their community, um, which now obviously operated under a much less kind of um, narrow minded focus. But before you get too deep into the bigger things, I want to talk about grants. Um, so and this is actually the, the last few comments are actually a great segue from uh, from tokens now to grants as a funding option. After, to after tokens, we're going to go into um, DAOs and then um, kind of hybrid models in between. How's everybody doing with like, should we take a mini break or should we just keep it rolling? I fear if we take a break, that we yeah. might disperse too, too far. Cool. Let's talk about grants. Um, Who has received a grant? Who wants to, maybe someone in the back here has this program yet? What was your experience? Um, so, it was nice to have support, but it's difficult to align everyone to set it long term. Um, it's quite difficult to prove to a decentralized process that you're always delivering, and uh, it can become quite. Uh, so, like, we got a grant from the DAO, so it was even a more particular process, right? Mm. Um, and I think. Yeah, going forward, there should be clearer mechanisms for, let's say, milestone-based grants, yeah. um, for sure, and also some accountability, so using those will also help with that process, because often people are saying they want to see the value of uh, what they are paying for. Yeah. I found maybe just to touch on that, I think almost like I've seen some grant funding processes be like more stringent than um, much smaller amounts, but much more stringency in terms of um, the decision-making process, in terms of the milestone. Um, I guess it's a very different accountability layer as well, because there is no investment being made, so it has to be a general investment. Um, and does anyone else want to add something? Their experience yet? Yeah, Grants are like band-aids. You know, they give you like, oh, okay, yeah, I, I have a problem. I don't have any economic model. I want to produce value but the value isn't valued by like the, the market. Yep. So like, give me some money and I'll do it for a while until the grant funding runs out and then, oh, I guess I have to die. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a sad thing. That's why I love Gitcoin grants. They're not like grants. 
It's like a continuous funny. You, you, and you can start making plans. When you, when you rely on bulk grants at the beginning, it's like you have to use that money to figure out how you're going to get your next money. You know, it's, it's almost like a, it's kind of wasted just on playing the grant circuit. If you can actually have a residual income coming in, and you can count on that, you can hire a developer, and you know where they're getting paid every month. You know, until of course that runs out, but it helps a lot. This is the opportunity cost of the nonprofit space in general. Is grants are a time-consuming process. You have to conform to each different grant making body and fill out their application you know do the whole thing that is time spent applying for money that uh, governments and for-profits have supplied to them in spades in capital markets or in tax pools so this is where the, the nonprofit is really like uh, has a huge opportunity cost in, in continually trying to find these grants and donations rather than just getting to work changing the world yeah. I think as a business being dependent on like Grant funding on a continuous level must be like must be extremely stressful. Uh, I mean, good, fair. Like being BC funded is stressful. Um, actually, probably any type of funding, if you're not running a sustainable business, is insanely stressful. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a that's a story for another day. Um, yeah, Griff, thanks so much for that comment. Uh, quickly, going to do like a re recap again. I mean, it's clear it's a nonprofit funding model. For me, grants are normally in exchange for services for like a community, so build something, deliver a specific service that serves the common good. Uh, normally, it's payment on delivery. What I've seen, it's like it's like very milestone-based payments, not on full delivery, but it's like you do the one thing, you get a payment, you do the other thing. Um, in general, fund open infrastructure and community initiatives. It's generally very small amounts compared to VC and tokens, and I think maybe that's where. The whole model again of like how can we fund this open source infrastructure falls short. We're pumping so much money into the one direction for for profit models, not like nearly enough um, into the other direction. Um, however, a lot of value accrues to the protocol layer here. Um, it's centralized decision making and centralized governance in many cases, what it feels like, even if it's a premium. Um, I've heard it can take a really long time to, like, to hear from the grant funding authority. Uh, we got a grant once ourselves, and to this date, still haven't received the second payment of the grant. And just being like, yeah, when is it coming? When is it coming? And just being like, oh yeah, it'll come out in the next batch. Uh, and it, this is like a very renowned grant funding um, com company and a foundation in the Ethereum space. Uh, we still haven't gotten it. <laughs> and if we were relying on that as, as a business, and I mean, the grant was approved like nine months ago, and then the first payment came a month after. And we, yeah, we still didn't get the rest. Um, <laughs> it's not like we're super dependent on it, but like monthly emails, anyway. I, I might interject that, I mean, Bitcoin Grants is pushing to decentralize decision making about grants to an algorithm to the CLR stuff. So I guess not all of them are decentralized in, or are centralized. And I'd also say that Wallet DAO uh, has a decentralized grant decision making process. So people are, are pushing, pushing that boundary. Oh, okay, sweet. Um, um, as a kind of not really a grand funding model, but um, I wanted to uh, I wanted Andrew to give Andrew a chance to talk a little bit about consensus as an example. I think consensus did so much in the Ethereum space super early on and really invested a lot at the protocol layer. It's definitely been on a grant funding model, although they have a grant funding. Um, uh, yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about that? I, I already kind of said it, uh, okay. but, but basically compared to traditional venture where a dollar in, you have $5 out, here's our product, here's our product market fit, here's our traction, uh, Consensus had lots of different uh, <laughs> tentacles and, 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 and some of them the value would accrue to the Ether token. Things like consensus diligence, things like uh, education, uh, and things like risk marketing for awareness. Uh, and and those wouldn't necessarily be something that would be venture investable. So so just kind of defining that, but, but I think that consensus did usher in the economy to a certain extent, or, or at least to a lot of that. I think, I think grants are an important part of the, any ecosystem. 
Um, because like if you have a vested interest in something succeeding, like you will be willing to put up money to help it do so. Or, like if you spend money because they want to further Ethereum, same with consensus. Um, we, uh, I received a grant from the EF, it was $420,000 uh, for payment channels work. Um, uh, with Lane is back there. Um, the Connects team, we work with them to, to deploy it. Uh, and that's like, you know, open source infrastructure for the whole space. Um, some of that work is, was like research oriented because we were the first ones to do it. And uh, it's hard to, you know, take that kind of risk if you aren't being supported in any way. Whereas, like, you know, they're still making a venture-funded business out of that, but, like, we're able to build a better product for Ethereum because of the grants that we, we received. I also received, like, an Andrew Keys grant. Uh, <laughs> so this was, you know, I was, like, broke and working in Consensus, and Andrew, like, let me crash his house for a month while he was in China raising money for Consensus. Like, you know, uh, people are really helpful if, you know, uh, you're also trying to help them succeed, too. Something that I've noticed with grants as well, like personalities still matter a lot, and building a good relationship with a grant funding authority. It may seem like you're applying to the, for example, to the EF, and like it's a very technical thing that absolutely must be funded, and someone else gets funded for you, and it is still very relationship driven. That's that's the experience that I've had, specifically because the space is small. Um, yeah, I, I was super super broke on this one. <laughs> Look where you are now. <laughs> Thank you, either. Um, yeah, I think I think we can answer this question by itself. Um, cool. All right. Let's talk about DAOs. It's getting it's getting so we, we're kind of moving through this whole like for profit older models into like non into the for profit old models into non profits and now into like new non profit models. Um, it could be for profit. Uh, they, they can exactly, and they can be for profit too. And we'll get into like the last section of the workshop, which is just discussing new hybrid models. So slapping a, a bonding curve onto a DAO, see what happens. Uh, but yeah, let's talk about DAOs more, um, more, more generally initially. Um, I, I want to open it up to the audience again. Um, audience, attendees, workshop, homies. Uh, <laughs> Uh, do you guys want to raise any specific point about a DAO? Have you received funding from a DAO? Uh, I, I, yeah. I do say that I'm a bad DAO actor. I am part of the Moloch DAO, and I think raise your hand if you're part of Moloch DAO. And, and I haven't voted yet, and I think that uh, with respect to these, let's say, common utilities, uh, governance is is not necessarily. Uh, Prioritized uh, or incentivized, and and you know, I'm I'm a proxy vote. I just kind of trust a meme, kind of sort of, <laughs> when he's behaving himself. And uh, and and I think that, that that that's an issue with like a public utility like a DAO, like governance. I think again, we're proxy voting. Yeah. I mean, you just raised quite well like that. I did. I no, he did. I, I vote personally in 100 Ether into the DAO, uh, and then from Spank Chain's uh, like ICO money, I vote okay. 500 Ether okay. uh, into the DAO, which is like half what the EF and the consensus <coughs> yeah. uh, But then I reach with that part because I need to focus more on Spank Chain. Uh, and so I just pull, pull that out. Okay, okay. Um, Can you talk about like the property yeah, voting or talk about all this stuff? Yeah. Um, so, uh, all, who, who here has heard of Moloch DAO? All right, cool. It's this thing. It's my shirt. Um, it's, I got a grant from the EF. I was a little frustrated about how uh, inefficient that process was. Uh, so I decided to launch a competing grants organization, uh, or, or, you know, cooperate, whatever. Um, so the, the way Moloch DAO works is uh, you can uh, put money in uh, and you buy shares. And you have to be voted in by the existing members. And you get uh, voting power proportional to the amount of money that you put in. Right? And the only way that the DAO can spend money uh, is to mint new shares. And so if you want a grant from the DAO, you will say, I want you know, X shares, and the grant will mint those shares, and that proportionally dilutes all of the existing members so that the money comes from everybody uh, who, 
who is in, right? If, if you, if the DAO has, for example, you know, a thousand ether, uh, you want a ten ether grant. Uh, it will, uh, if it has like a thousand shares, it'll win ten shares, and then you'll get those ten shares. And you can then rage quit. Um, and so, two other mechanisms. Uh, there's a there's a seven day voting period and a seven day grace period. So during the voting period, everybody can vote, and then that vote is final. And before the money is actually spent, everybody who didn't vote yes uh, has the opportunity to withdraw all of their funds uh, and leave basically everybody else uh, to, to pay for it. And it's, it, it makes it so that if you disagree strongly enough uh, with the, the, the way that the DAO is going to spend your money, you can take your money and leave. Right? So the thing is, you know, Andrew's not really a bad actor. Andrew's just like, implicitly trusting the people who are voting to make decent decisions. And if he's ever made aware of the people who are actually voting to spend the money, not making decisions that he thinks are reasonable, he can pull, he has a week to pull out his money uh, before uh, that money gets spent. Uh, and that's pretty powerful because it means he always has sovereignty uh, over his funds. Unlike some DAOs where like, if you want to take out your money, you actually have to submit a proposal and get everybody else to vote let you pull out your money. And so if that DAO gets captured, uh, you can potentially never get your money. Uh, that's, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't think that was safe. Um, so, so far, uh, that, that's like the mechanism of Moloch, um, but we, we launched it in February. Uh, we raised, uh, right now it has about a million dollars. Um, it has, it was about 20 of us that were crazy enough to put in 100 ether at the beginning. Uh, when we're just like, you know, we have no idea where this is going to go, but like, seems like a good idea, let's try it. Uh, and then eventually we, we proved that we could coordinate and fund grants for, we funded ETH2 reports, uh, we funded ETH2 development, uh, we funded um, uh, we funded a mixer recently, we have uh, funded a bunch of uh, core infrastructure um, audits for, for the payment channels that connects this building. Um, and uh, you know, sort of the highest moment of this was like when Vitalik and Joe and Consensus and the F each decided to put in a thousand ether also, and, and really give, give us a lot more firepower uh, to to be able to not only like engage people in the community to uh, you know potentially uh, execute grants that we wanted to to uh, see see done, uh, but also just it amplifies the amount of value that we have uh, to spend. And so far, that's been going really well. Um, I, I think what, one of the key things that's really cool about it is just how efficient the whole process is, right? Uh, from the time that you submit a proposal, you will get your answer in a week, and you will get your money in a week after that, right? Uh, if, if it passes. And so, you know, there, there's some due diligence, that, you know, going back and forth, negotiating process uh, before you submit it. Um, but, like, that whole thing, the fastest we ever ran this was like, I tweeted, <coughs> we need an ETH2 test runner so that the, the client teams can run tests against their builds to make sure that like if something changes, you know, they know it broke something. And the next day, a guy was like, I'll do it. Uh, and we're like, all right, we interviewed him. The next day after that, we're like, all right, well, he seems good. Uh, and so we submitted a proposal for like $20,000. Now, uh, we, or he? Uh, we, so we worked with him to form the proposal uh, because we, it was our idea. And then it was, you know, Ant Antoine is now the CTO of White Block. He, he came on to, to help execute. And it was like a one, you know, one month project, right? The, the key thing is like a one month contract work. It's like not even worth doing. It's not even worth thinking about for like going to the EF for money because like the amount of time and effort you have to spend uh, just to get the proposal through is like more, you know, value than the whole grant. Right? And so being able to have like fast, uh, efficient grants is, I, I think, a, a nice like um, complementary aspect to, to EF grants. Um, and, and I think that the model has sort of taken off also because we're seeing the, the same code being used for uh, Yang Dao, which is like a super pack to fund Andrew Yang memes, uh, and like Meta Cartel, which is like a bunch of application layer uh, developers coming together to fund application layer infrastructure. Um, and, and like Trojan Dow, which is an art collective, you know, sort of uh, different, different story. Um, but I, I think that it also presents a model for the EF to credibly decentralize uh, their funding. So they, they get criticism because they, you know, they're like, how do you guys make your decisions? How do you decide where to spend your money? All, all this stuff. And it's like, 
well, if they could put more of their money into these apps for like specific areas of the ecosystem, then uh, they would be engaging uh, the, the other ecosystem stakeholders um, and uh, be, being able to collaborate on making these decisions and do it in a transparent way. So all of this stuff is on chain, right? All the votes, the funding. So that's the Moloch primer. I think it's. Uh, thank you so much for that. I mean, um, I think it's one of the biggest contributions in the space, um, like that I've seen in like for the past year. I think the amount of. I mean, the coolest. One of the things that I love most about Moloch is the way that the actual contract starts. You look at it, it says like, please steal this code. Yeah. Um, which is like one of the guiding principles of open source, but like since we've, since Moloch came out, we've seen so many iterations of that and so quickly. Like the space is literally exploding with ideas. Um, and that's something that is really important at this point that we iterate and that we test quickly. Um, I think even beyond of what Moloch itself is trying to achieve, the code itself has taken on its own life form um, in things like MetaCartel. Is anyone from MetaCartel here? Yeah? Yeah, if you want, I can explain Meta Cartel. Yeah, yeah. So, Peter Pan, uh, which is the summer of Meta Cartel, uh, basically got rejected by Moloch, I think. He tried to get a, a grant from Moloch, or right. join as a member. Right. I tried to get him in, and the rest of the members were like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, he got rejected, and he got pissed, and he was like, right, I'm going to fork the code. And so, he's got the tech startup background, so it's really more the application layer, the UX, and so. Uh, Meta Cartel is basically the same primer as Moloch, but to fund the application later. And uh, but that's a different story than Moloch because Moloch, since it's uh, funding it too, is still grants given. But Meta Cartel makes more sense to maybe switch to for profit. And so this is going to this is like an ongoing discussion, and it's going to probably like finalized because the first wave of grants. So for instance, like we fund Minbase and Kickback, which are like event ticketing. Uh, NFTs or staking, one kind of thing, and um, basically uh, they're like starting to incorporate. And so maybe we're going to do uh, another DAO structure um, to kind of get maybe institutional investors or other people. So, anyways, like regarding business models, it's different from uh, Moloch, which is still like a charity, um, and we might switch to for profit. But so yeah, basically it's like Moloch for the application layer. Super cool, and like now, great to um, segue into the next topic as well, but like, we're seeing like a lot of experimentation and people actually moving from non-profit models again into for-profit models, which is really cool and really good. Uh, so I think, um, I think what we'll see over the next six months and year as well is like the reinvigoration of models like what the DAO were originally trying to do. Um, and I can't wait for like a VC to actually, for a real VC to come along and say, well actually, Let's allocate capital into the sub DAO that will then invest into like these these set of projects, um, which is going to be really yeah really well, exciting to see. Actually, we're also uh, planning to explore with cohort-based funding, so kind of like uh, going towards like a mini Y Combinator kind of thing no coming next year. Awesome. I think there's been some really really great experiments so far with DAOs, but I think we're still in the very early stages of this experimentation, as you as yeah. you pointed out. And I think centralization and decentralization is still a spectrum. Um, you know, you could have a DAO being more decentralized, but I've also heard I mean say if there's something he doesn't like, you know, he'll make a couple calls and like that's not gonna pass. So there is some extent of centralization in in uh, DAOs depending how they're set up. So there are certain aspects of DAOs where uh, governance is, is one question of uh, of how do we make decisions so that you know they're they're representative of the group. Um, how do we address on-chain voting issues with people who are not voting? Um, and is that really a representative decision or are these stakeholders actually checked out and not really paying attention uh, to these voting systems? Um, also long-term sustainability and scalability. Um, Moloch, Metacartel, these are great examples, but they're still um, deflating, continuously deflating the, the uh, stake of everyone involved. So if you carry this out to its logical conclusion, once Moloch has spent all its money, the next person to come in puts in 100 ETH, and they suddenly have a very small proportion of governance over their money. Uh, and meanwhile, everyone who was in Moloch before, who spent all of Moloch's old money, uh, now has an equal say over the new money coming in. So if you take this to the long term, uh, it still has a question of sustainability and scalability of funding, which is, I think, the problem that we're here to discuss. Yeah, these are all valid criticisms, by the way. Uh, I, th I think one thing to remember with all of these decentralized models is that 
humans in human nature naturally tend to flock or look for leadership, and they tend to look for leaders, mm -hmm. even in these centralized systems. Mm -hmm. So you can say what you want, but like, I mean, you're kind of the leader of like, well, like that. The same with that. There's a lot of things I wanted that didn't happen. Uh, also, just to be clear, right? And like, there's a couple things where like I had to bring all my shares to bear, right? Like, there was a lot of people who didn't want Yang Dao to get funding for Pollock, and I really wanted Yang Dao to get funding for Pollock. So I voted with every single one of my 601 shares to make sure that we get one Sumner share at 100 personally public, to, to make sure that uh, Yang Dao went through. And some people were like so upset about that that they almost rage quit uh, and took their money and went home, but then you know, they, they decided not to. Um, and that's interesting, because they had that option, right? And so you could say, maybe I anticipated that it would piss people off just enough that they wouldn't leave. <laughs> uh, but that's, you know, how it ended up. And I think actually most of the members are, uh, in retrospect, happy with that decision, because the people who joined are people who, like Peter Pan, who now runs Meta Cartel, who is doing uh, the, the coordination for Yangao, and, uh, uh, ben Gist, who is the, the Yang Dao, since it uses the same code, they're, they're actually what we're the uh, mobile app, uh, or mobile, mobile UI for uh, Moloch Dao, which Moloch Dao could eventually use also. Right? Um, and, and he's also funding uh, building Dao House, which now can like you can spin up your own Moloch Dao and, and see all of the uh, dashboard of all of the Moloch Dao's. Um. I think that's maybe one aspect of Dao is that in this blockchain space where there's a large ethos of code is law, we often forget that there's a cultural aspect to these as well, and having uh, Amin as the steward of Moloch, if you could call him that, um, and, and I mean each DAO kind of has this leader or uh, group of people that, that uh, the community looks to to steward these DAOs in the right direction, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, like that's a decentralization is a spectrum, and we're at one point on that spectrum, and hopefully we can move further towards that decentralization, that there are certain puzzle pieces we need before we can continue moving down, uh, down that spectrum. To, to also add one more thing, it's just like, I'm actually st uh, taking a step back from my sort of active participation in Moloch DAO uh, in terms of just like a lot of the coordination work, uh, due diligence, and stuff like that. And we're, I'm excited to see how it's going to evolve as other members step up and fill the roles uh, that we were, uh, that I was doing before. Um, so I'm going to be, it's not going to be just me. <laughs> There's, there's a lot of people who, who help make this happen. Um, you know, build the sites and like talk to the teams and bring ideas to bear. Um, I think uh, giving them more of a platform is going to be important. Cool. I want to move to the. I think we've kind of discussed this again. Um, I want to move to the last topic. Which I think it's really exciting. And guys, thanks as well for bearing with us. Um, I hope it's been entertaining uh, through this pretty long workshop. Um, Cool, the last thing to really talk about are new hybrid models that are emerging. Um, personally, something that I think is really, really interesting. And I just want to ask into the audience, is anyone, um, we'll, we'll explain a little bit as well, is anyone already familiar with models like the Common Stack uh, or the Aragon fundraising app uh, or something like continuous organizations? Hands up, okay, about a half of the room, cool. Um, Maybe to open up the question then to those people who raised their hand. Um, well, what, why don't you explain it to the rest of us simpletons? Yeah, excellent, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so for me, what these two models really, com what these two models really combine are now combining governance and DAO structures with fundraising and, and token sales. But the main, I think, the key difference between these two is that these are now they're looking at continuous financing mechanisms. And a lot of them are looking through financing mechanisms through bonding curves, which are instead of just issuing a lump sum of tokens, um, you really issue them continuously over time um, according to supply and demand in the market. Um, in exchange for funding, there's taxation mechanisms um, that we can build into the curves. Um, yeah, so for me, the hybrid models kind of are continuous fundraising models for DAOs, um, which is DAOs plus token-based financing. Just gonna ask quickly, who here doesn't know what a token bonding curve is. But you know what? I'll do it for. <laughs> you gotta ask who knows what it is. Who, who knows what it is? <laughs> okay, I'm, assu I'm assuming. I'm assuming most people know, but I'll just just explain for Andrew. Um, 
it's essentially um, an autonomous market maker. What do we mean with autonomous market maker? So normally, if you the previous token launches that we've seen, someone makes the smart contract and issues all of the tokens at once. Um, and in this case, the tokens are continuously issued through kind of a market maker. And what this means also is, so it's not just a token issuance, but it's also a, an exchange and liquidity provider. Um, and this is the most the stereotypical design that you see, or not design, but just pictures to represent it. It's actually a terrible way to represent bonding curve, um, but it's what the industry has come accustomed to. So this is the supply demand curve from market economics. You have the price on one side and then the supply at the bottom. Uh, and then you have a curve that governs the issuance. So it's essentially um, a function, it's a mathematical function, it can be exponential, it can be sigmoidal, that gets encoded into the smart contract. Uh, and so as more tokens are issued, the price increases according to that curve. Um, if people can also burn tokens by just sending them back to the contract, and then the price decreases again. So essentially, people are always trading along this curve. Does it mean, though, that the actual trading looks like that? The trading can look very much like like a normal chart. Um, so remember that this is the supply and not kind of time. Um, so it's a really interesting new mechanism because it provides liquidity instantaneously and it provides really great feedback loops to whatever that token issuance mechanism represents. Um, so a lot of these, let's say, hybrid funding models or hybrid organizations are looking at the token model representing membership. Um, but then obviously membership could also, for example, equate to returns that are generated by that um, continuous organization. Um, and um, we have Jeff here from the Common Stack as well as Griff. Uh, and I think the Common Stack is one of the most exciting projects um, that I've seen in the space come about that is really pursuing these hybrid type models. Um, and specifically interesting in the context of funding open source infrastructure. Um, yeah, Jeff, you want to give it? Yeah, absolutely. So I think we've, we've touched on these topics multiple times uh, throughout, throughout the day, um, and I think that we really uh, need, to, need to close the loop from uh, raising funds, allocating those funds, um, making decisions as a group, um, and then measuring impact. And without those, those, that full loop, uh, we have a really hard time uh, basically governing how we're going to raise and allocate those funds. Um, so we, we look at Malik Dao, we see this as an amazing community of people who have come together, um, basically contributed their funds into a pool, and then make decisions based on the amount uh, contributed on how those should be spent. Awesome. Um, the issues with it, long term, um, the funds slowly uh, deflate, so you have more people joining, contributing funds, um, but there's less funds to be spent over time because those funds are continually being spent. Um, when you introduce something like a bonding curve, um, and the, the uh, basic bonding curve that Paul described here, um, a lot of people have criticisms of it in that it could be considered a Ponzi scheme. Uh, basically, people uh, put money in. When someone else puts money in, that first person can sell and make a profit. So this is an issue. But if we give that token multiple forms of value, so with the in the common stack, we're working on a token bonding curve model we're calling the augmented bonding curve. And that token is not worth just a claim on the collateral pool, like in Moloch, if you rage quit, you take your portion or what's left of it out. Um, but we also give it another value in the uh, governance of, uh, of how those tokens are spent. So when you go, when uh, more people buy in, the price of the token goes up. Um, some people may want to sell, and this is where the, the race to the exit, the Ponzi scheme of a traditional bonding curve comes in. Uh, with the augmented bonding curve as the price, uh, as people sell out, if you're the last person holding tokens um, in Moloch, you're uh, holding the bag, basically. In the augmented bonding curve, you are holding all the governance power of that community. So we have a, a special mechanism called the exit tribute. When people exit the curve, you pay a small uh, tribute to the community, which is kind of like we talked about before, the, the opt-in agreement. You know, if you are going to join this community, you understand that when you sell this token, you're going to pay 5% or 10% to the community. This goes into a communal funding pool. And then if you help hold all those tokens, you basically have governance over that funding pool. So this also encourages the, uh, an opposite pressure of more people to buy. So you have this interplay of people wanting to sell to claim returns, people wanting to buy for governance over that collateral pool. Uh, and that, that creates a natural volatility on the curve, and that creates continuous funding for the project through the exit tribute. 
So this is just one type of mechanism. Bonding curves are a very new concept. The solution space is okay. very open. Um, and I think we, we've designed the augmented bonding curve for a nonprofit model. You could have all sorts of different mechanisms included there. You could include quadratic uh, voting or CLR matching. Um, you could, uh, and this is kind of the approach of the common stack, is we're coming at this from a modular component approach. So you could have all sorts of different mechanisms that you could build into those bonding curves to suit that to each niche use case. Um, on top of that, we are working on some novel governance processes that we see a lot of problems with on-chain governance, uh, mostly apathy, um, or you know, people being busy, or people not you know, following up, how many DAOs are you a part of? You know? uh, are you checking in with each of them? Do you know when each of those votes is going on? The user interface isn't always great in these early experiments, so we're working on a governance process called conviction voting, which is less of a voting system, but more of a um, preference broadcast, you're always signaling what you want to see done in the ecosystem, um, and that uh, conviction grows over time. So this also gives uh, long-standing minorities more weight over a last-minute whale that comes in and says, no, this is how the vote should go, which we also see in, in on-chain governance. Um, if there's a certain vote, maybe in Moloch, uh, maybe there's someone with a lot of tokens who doesn't want to see that go through, and last minute they come in and just quash it. Um, I mean, everyone else can quit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There are protections against it, but we just want to see sort of this, this balance of, uh, of a long-standing minority having some weight against uh, a late whale coming in and saying this is how it should go. Not that that's a bad thing in, in the small ecosystem that we're, we're working with today. Uh, we do want these safeguards, these people who know what's best for these communities, but when we're looking at long-term scaling this um, into larger ecosystems, uh, we want to make sure that there is proper uh, community representation in, in the governance. Um, so yeah, so that's basic, basically the, the uh, long and the short of the common stack. Um, there are, we're, we're basically looking to build a, a library of components that can be used to build DAOs for all sorts of different use cases. Um, there is no one answer to how do we govern economies. Um, you know, a, an economy around ETH 2.0 may be very different from an economy around trash cleanup, may be very different from a, a community economy. So we have all sorts of different um, components that you can basically combine and create your own DAO suited for your ecosystem. Um, and one other really important part of the common stack is uh, the simulation. So if everyone, has anyone heard of CatCat here? Show of hands quickly. Um, so this is a simulation tool that is has just come out from Block Science. It was just open sourced through the common stack uh, a month ago. Um, and the, the cool thing about the common stack components is all of these will be rigorously designed from mathematical first principles. So you can just take them off the shelf, combine them, plug them into the simulator and see how your token network will respond to stress tests before you start coding. Um, and we can go away from this whole idea of, I have an idea, I'm going to write a white paper, and I now launch this economy, and then we'll see what happens, um, which could have disastrous con consequences when we're talking about billion dollar public infrastructure, which is really what we're, what we're building here. Yeah, we, I, one of your coworkers, Sargo, right? Yeah. Uh, he told me, he's like, it's really fun watching you play out the explore part of my explore exploit algorithm. Uh, because, you know, we're, we're, you know, I didn't do this, or I, we didn't start Moloch to like save the world, right? We just wanted to fund E2 stuff like then and like, continue to fund it. Uh, so we, I, I try to, uh, you know, uh, practice meme driven development. Uh, so we, with Moloch, we have memed the, the DAO, we made it cool again, uh, and you know, people want to join them, and, and we've all been able to learn from this experience, and, and we're all sort of inspired by it. Uh, and, and everybody who's in the DAO will, will be able to take that with to any other DAO that they join, uh, and, and have that knowledge, and, and bring it to, to other other uh, projects as well. Uh, and so it's it's fun, you know, to, to have this kinds of. Uh, there's like, there always needs to be somebody who goes first, and like just try something, even though you. You're not doing it for, for all the use cases, and then other people who, who, who use that as like a research project in order to uh, le learn from that and hone something that might then be able to be taken to the, the broader market uh, and markets that we might not have even anticipated uh, that, that being used for. So excited for what you guys have coming. Yeah, question if I can. Yep. Uh, Cat, Cat. 
um, does it uh, attempt to simulate human behavior in terms of people purchasing and hence the explore exploit kind of scenario? I'm just wondering how, sort of how does that work in terms of getting that uh, input? Is it just sort of based on theory uh, or just greedy algorithms? Sure. So CAD-CAD stands for Complex Adaptive Dynamics Computer-Aided Design. So economies are complex systems. When you embed humans, and actually it's a, a cybernetic governance system and also second order cybernetic governance system, where we are part of the system that we're trying to govern. So it makes it a really tricky problem. Yeah. Um, the only, and I mean, we, we definitely get a lot of skepticism when we say we're simulating economic behavior um, because humans are predictable. It is not a um, rational economic actor that we can uh, predict behavior. But when we put uh, human behavior on a blockchain, you only have a certain number of allowed actions. Uh, so in Bitcoin, for example, it's buy sell, very basic network. In other networks, there might be governance, there might be voting, there might be different things, but still you have a very well-defined set of actions. And because on a blockchain, economic code or the code is what you have to follow. In our, in our real economies, we have gray markets, we have black markets, we have cash transactions, this can be captured. Um, but when you put it all on a blockchain, you kind of get this economic big data and you can uh, define agents that pursue a profit extractive behavior, for example. And when you run Monte Carlo analyses and parameter sweeps, you can get a pretty good uh, at least envelope of behavior. You can see where your system uh, fails systemically before you start coding. So it's not necessarily predictive saying someone is going to do this. It's saying this is the, uh, the list of allowed behaviors. And if we throw in 10,000 agents with 10,000 different objectives and run Monte Carlo analyses and parameter sweeps and really use the big data uh, crunching algorithms and say this is where the system could fail. It's not saying we're going to capture everything. I mean, when, when we started simulating bridges, you know, someone forgot to include harmonic resonance until uh, Tacoma Narrows, and now we've built that into our model. So this is turning uh, crypto economic design into an engineering discipline, basically, that we can continue improving that model the more we learn. Thank you so much. Um, Jeff, that was a great comment. I think maybe the last comment for me, I think we're kind of, a, well, we're at the end of the workshop. We did kind of a full, I think almost like a 360 round of going from traditional for-profit models into the token ICOs craze that we saw, um, then into grant funding for public infrastructure, always guiding with this question is like, how can we fund the commons? Um, what model is right for which business case? Um, I think if we are to ever see kind of a, like a revival of like, um, very large scale open source funding, like we did with the early ICOs, it will probably be through models as like Gref is describing, which are incredibly new, thoughtful ways of really using simulation design to build these economies and using kind of, I think um, these bonding curve type models are much closer in incentive design as to what you might see in like, in, in like venture, venture capital funding rounds. Um, really like leveling up, going from stage to stage to stage. Um, so I think we're baking like the best of two worlds together at this stage. Uh, I'm really, really excited to see, keep, a, keep an eye out for all of these um, initiatives because these organizations have much fundraising and common sec, um, specifically, um, as they are really kind of pushing the space forward a lot. Uh, and then I want to give a huge thank you to all of you uh, for sitting in this two-hour workshop, uh, making all these amazing contributions, and thank you so much, guys. Um,